Good evening, Jesus Image family. If we just close our eyes and lift our hands and begin to look to the Lamb of God. Now this morning as we were singing, come Lord Jesus, come, I felt this a holy invitation from the bridegroom to come to him. And as I was on my way here, I kept hearing this gentle whisper saying, come, come, come deeper, come lower, come hungry. And I want you to listen to the words of your beloved. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Yes, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, Jesus, I ask you to teach us today, O oh, humble one, you who have a gentle heart, teach us to be internally needy, internally poor, God. Teach us that apart from you, we are nothing and we can do nothing. The scripture says human effort accomplishes nothing and today we don't want to sing songs in our own strength lord it is in your light that we see light so teach us tonight how to yield to your voice and we ask you lord teach us your ways come on can you begin to just say that to the lord say jesus teach me your ways show me your face so that we would honor you Jesus
Jesus, your name, your name is exalted in the heavens, exalted. name is exalted tonight, Lord. Your name is exalted tonight. Jesus be lifted high tonight. Let the name that is above every other name be lifted high in this place tonight. that is above every name be lifted high in this place tonight.
sing it out. Hallelujah, hallelujah, you reign forevermore. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah, 
was slain, his blood overcame. The lamb that was slain, his blood overcame. Yeah. The lamb that was slain, his blood overcame. That's worth celebrating. The lamb that was slain, his blood overcame. Hey. The lamb that was slain, his blood overcame.
Jesus, we honor your presence here. Thank you for the joy of your presence, Lord. Oh, don't you just feel so much joy in his presence? I feel so full right now. I feel like I just want more. I want more of the Lord. And I just want to stay here in this joy. Um, go ahead and I invite you back to your seat and just take that joy with you. Take the Lord with you and stay in a posture to receive more tonight. Lord, we love you. And we're here for you. We honor your word and we honor your presence. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Before I receive the offering, I just wanna make mention of a few things coming this next week. Thank you, Daniel. Um, that burning hunger for the Lord that you feel here, we're taking that with us to California. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so California is hungry for God, and we want to go uh, to the West Coast on our third week of Jesus Tour. Yes, yeah, so that's going to be in Fullerton and Pasadena. So if you're watching online, uh, we welcome you, and obviously those in the room too. And um, also wanted to make mention of our pastors' conference, which is September. Yes. <laughs> September 21st and 22nd, and if you are in ministry in any capacity and you're hungry for the Lord and you've poured out and you want to receive, this is the place to come. Many people in, in ministry have come last year and were filled with more of the Lord and heard from many amazing honorable men and women leaders that um, poured into them. So yes, wanted to make, sure to make mention of that. But why I'm here tonight is to open the word of God and I just wanna pray before I do. Father, I just ask that you would open the scriptures to us, that you would reveal your nature, you would reveal Jesus to us as we read it together in your presence, Lord. We love you, Jesus, amen. I was reading in Philippians, and what I love about the end of Philippians is Paul is commending the Philippian church on their heart towards giving. And so I just wanna read this to you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalon Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. And now that I seek the gift not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. And he's telling them, thank you so much, you sent aid to me. But he's already learned that it's not the things that satisfies him. He's hungry for the Lord. He wants to preach the gospel in purity. And that is his food. That is his desire. And that's what I want for us. I want to be a church that isn't so... Hear me. I want the love of God to compel us to give where it's not even a thought, it's just who we are. Because we're hungry for him and we want his gospel to advance. We want Jesus to be known in the West Coast and in Florida and all across the nation, just like this. So he goes on and says, it is a sweet smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. The fact that they gave to him while he was preaching the gospel, they partnered with the gospel. They partnered with that message. Let us do that. This is it, guys. This is why we're alive. This is that we get one chance. And I want my, my whole heart and my posture of my heart every day to be worshiped to God in all things, a sweet smelling aroma. And so when we give to the church, when you give into the bucket, you're, you've got to remember who you're giving to and why. And then he says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. So he supplies for you. When you care about his church and what he cares about, he takes care of you. You don't have to worry. So Lord, we just um, pray over this offering. Father, I thank you, Jesus that as we prepare our sacrifice and our offering to you, that you would get the glory, that your name would be known throughout the world, and that we would be a part of that, Lord, through our seed. Jesus, we give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're watching online, there's a number on your screen you can give that way, and if you're in the room, there's a QR code up there you can use, and if you need an envelope, an usher will bring you one, or you can rush the buckets. Thank you so much.
Okay, good evening. How are you guys? So tonight we have my dad with us and he likes to come behind the curtain so we can welcome my dad. <laughs> there he is. I love you too. You may be seated. But I want Jesse to stay here. Okay. Yeah. You know, we all daddies love our children, right? Well, this morning, I was listening to you. You're good. <laughs> she is really good. I am I'm kind of amazed, of course, because I remember things you don't know about <laughs> when she was younger. You know what I mean? But I just want to say about my precious baby something. So, okay. it's okay, yeah. She always is telling me what to say and not to say. You know what I mean? I just don't listen. <laughs> but the Lord has really gifted her in declaring his word with beauty yeah, and clarity. And, you know, not only clearly, Jessica, you've done such an amazing job, which really amazes me as your dad that the anointing is with that clarity. And so keep doing it, girl. I love you, you know that. Now listen, listen, I gotta, I gotta show you something. Uh, Jesse, come back, come on. And dear John, come up here, and Amy, come up here. And uh, Amy and Aaron, come here, okay? I have an amazing, Thing to let you listen to all of you. Now, I did not know I had this till I was in the car today. I came here so excited, I was flying. Okay? So, back in 1977, I began working for the Catherine Kuhlman Ministry when I was 24 years old. And I think I've shared that with you. So, they gave me at that time some of her beautiful messages on tape, which I still have. Just their wonderful treasures and sometimes in the car I like to, to put that CD on and listen to the old sermons from Miss Kuhlman. What I had forgotten is they gave me some of her Sunday morning services that I did not know I had till an hour ago. Oh my gosh. Well maybe an hour and a half. <laughs> and here's Catherine leading in praise and worship. And I completely did not know I had it on my phone. I'm let you hear some of it. Would you, would you like that? Okay. Now, now this is the, probably this is the only phone on the globe that has that. So I better not lose this. I am not giving it to you. He said I was going to give it to him. Keep dreaming, brother, keep dreaming. <laughs> but here's what I'm going to do, though, because I need somebody like Johan. Where is Johan? Probably in a trailer. In a trailer, okay. <laughs> somebody needs to take these off so I don't lose them. I will do that. Okay? Yeah. I have nine songs only, only nine songs of Catherine leading praise. Would you like to hear some? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. So here is Miss Kuhlman leading in a song that I'm sure a lot of you probably heard when you were younger. In the church, Onward Christian Soldiers. It's number 33 if you have a songbook. If you do not have a songbook, you know the song without it. The first two, the last verses. Stand up, every heart, every voice, living in praise and adoration on the Lord. Sing it everywhere. That's plenty. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Here's one of my favorite ones. 77 in your songbook, please. Remain standing as you sing it. Number 77, the first two and the last verses. And while you're finding the number on the chorus, lift it. Sing, oh, sing. Sing, 
Do you know any of these? <laughs> but this is Catherine Kuhlman leading them. There is a fountain filled with blood. It's Judy, come here, C come on. Now, we are here tonight because of this. This is where it all began with Miss Kuhlman. And I am going to give all these songs to Michael and Jessica to protect them and use them and let the world hear them. We'll do it. You promise? I promise. Yeah. But this is... <laughs> She's leading that. <laughs> now there's one that very few of you even know but I'm hoping you learn it. Hide me, oh my Savior, hide, till the storms of life be past. Safe into the haven guide and receive my soul at last. We need those back in the church, okay? Maybe that's why I'm still alive. I don't know. Okay? Hide me, oh my Just this one. He's getting blessed. You can learn that tonight. <laughs> it's quite simple, but maybe not now. I'll give you time to think about it. And I'm going to minister the word, but I'm going to tell you something. Do you mind just going on the instrument for a minute? And you two come here, guys. Now, I'm going to, you know, I rarely do this, but when you were in Los Angeles, a few days ago, actually Southern Cali, whatever. And you began singing. I could not stop watching. And I could not stop the tears. I don't often cry when people lead worship. I get a headache. <laughs> you make me cry. And so do you. And when you, and I don't know that girl, the dancer, what's her name, the... Katie, oh, Katie, come here. Come here, darling, come here. I got to tell you something. When you took off, my heart almost stopped. I mean, 
whatever came on you and you did whatever you did, I'm telling you, you know, I've recognized the anointing now for a long time. Girl, you got it. Amen. And what a beautiful anointing you have. I pray. Stretch your hands towards her. Come here. Lord, thank you for this beautiful gift you've given all of us. Thank you, dear Jesus, for... It's Katie, right? Isn't that her name? Katie, Katie. Katie. Well, the Lord knows your name. I just have to remember it. <laughs> Lord, thank you for Katie. And I pray you'll protect her and keep her healthy, keep her peaceful, and give her a greater relationship with you than she's ever known in her life, that she'll get stronger in you, in the faith, that she'll bless so many of us for years to come. In Jesus' name. You know, when you were, when you began to dance, now I was watching, I think, Amy, you two up there. Weren't you there? I think you were. But, you know, for some reason, I was kind of busy, you know, how you, you watch and then you do other stuff. But I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop watching. And I don't know what happened to you, girl, but you were in the spirit like big time. Like you were really strong. God is going to do some amazing things with you in the future. I think you know that already. I think my part, maybe, and maybe after the service, we can all go back there and listen to more of these. Because I, you know what? I think they need to come back to the church. I think those, because those songs carry doctrine and amazing depth of truth, you know. And you, sweet people, are the ones that seem to have such a, maybe I should say, a new anointing to sing it. You know, in the past, we had our own style and a little maybe more dramatic than we should have been. But anyways, I mean, you listen to Catherine, she was very dramatic. And so was I, you know. But the thing is, today, young people have their own style, way. And I'm trying to learn that way, by the way. I mean, it's not easy for me. But first time I came to one of your meetings, I got so... Well, I couldn't even stand in the meeting long. I had to walk out. I thought I'm going to lose my hearing. <laughs> but then later, you guys listened to me and calmed things down. Thank the Lord. And thank you for not having smoke everywhere here. You know, it's just like, I can't handle that smoke. I'm thinking, dear God, it's so foggy in here. Why, 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 why the smoke? But it's okay, you know. I went to preach for... A, uh, Russell Johnson up in Seattle a few weeks ago, and the smoke was everywhere. And I just, thousands in that stadium, and I said, I am not walking on that platform. <laughs> I said to Maria, I said, you tell him to stop that smoke and then I'll come up. I was afraid it was gonna mess my hair. <laughs> or something. I mean, it's like smoke, everywhere smoke. Okay, now you guys like it, God bless you all. But I'm from that old world, you know, whatever. But I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this honestly, that service in Southern California, there was something special about that. And I believe the Lord's going to do something amazing, and I keep saying it, when you move into the new building. You know, it's, it's, it's great here, okay? It's wonderful in this building, but it's going to hit big when you go there, okay? So even though we built this building years ago, and I used to preach here for, what, 20 years I was in this building? But, you know, it's like it's, like it's a new day. It's a new breath of uh, wind, you know. We just can't go back to the way it was. But the songs don't change, okay? And the, and the, and the need in, in God's people doesn't change. So can, can we just stand up and say thank you to these amazing young people? Really? All of them, really, all of them. Oh, wow. The bear, uh, and John, too, by the way. God bless John. Okay, guys, you may be seated. Okay, John, you can go sit down now. You're going to come up at the end then, huh? Pardon, darling? Can you, like, a little fan? No, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. 
She asked me if I was hot. No, no, I'm just perfect. Thank the Lord. Okay. Now, John, you're going to stay till I'm done. And then you're going to come back and help me lead some praise and worship. So you're not, I told him earlier, you know, early, I said, you're not going to leave and go and get some hamburger or something. <laughs> I was only having fun with him. I made him laugh so much one night a few months ago, he, he still can't forget that. There is a wild side to me, but anyways. All right, I'm going to minister the word, but first let's just thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. And to you belongs the glory and all the honor and all the praise and all the majesty. Precious, precious Jesus, we worship you. And Lord, I pray you'll give us such an understanding today of this truth that you want us all to hear and to live it and to walk in it. In Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, now, <clears throat> we had decided that I would speak this morning and Jesse would speak tonight. And then I called last night, I said, baby, I am so tired, I don't think I can make it in the morning. I said, you better have a message. She said, I already have it. I said, good, I'll do Sunday night. Okay. And then in the car on the way here, she said, what are you going to speak about? I said, the armor of God. And then she said, oh, dad, I'm glad because I was going to teach on that this morning. So... Thank the Lord you did not, because you need to learn what I say first. <laughs> I'm only kidding, guys. Only kidding. <laughs> All right, so let's go, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, and I miss Michael big time. I love my children, and Michael is very dear to me more than you'll ever know. We talk on the phone every day. I'm not kidding you. Probably what? Twice, three, four times a day sometimes. It depends on what's going on. But thank you for supporting my wonderful family. And the people said, Amen. Finally, my brethren, I'm reading verse 10 of, of Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, Paul is reminding the church here. This is a very urgent reminder where he tells the believer something very important. So let's go on. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or schemes of the, of the devil. For, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand... Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Can you put your hands up to heaven a minute? Lord, I pray you'll speak so powerfully and so clearly that your people will remember this message for a long time. And Lord, I pray you'll use this to strengthen your people. 
in Jesus' name. And the people said, so like I said earlier, Paul begins with a very urgent reminder <clears throat> what he says finally. And then he tells us that the life of a Christian is lived on the battlefield. He reminds us this is war. And then he tells us that our war is spiritual. And so we need spiritual weapons. That's how he starts. And then he says something powerful. He says, even though we Christians belong to the spiritual realm, we live in the natural realm. It's all clear in this portion. And he begins with, finally, be strong in the Lord. Well, how? I think we should ask the first question is, when he says, be strong in the Lord, I think we need to ask, how, Lord? What does it mean to be strong in the Lord? Because he starts with a warning, finally, my brethren, pay attention. This is important. This is about war, how to win. Be strong in the Lord. Now, you cannot really win any war until your fellowship with the Lord is solid rock. Or as they say, rock solid, you know. Your, your oneness with Jesus has got to be so connected, so one in the Lord. Now notice he did not say be strong with the Lord, in the Lord. In the Lord means you are literally in him. And to be in him is more than with him. It's like someone being in the pool, in the water, meaning that water surrounds you. You're in it. To be in the Lord is different than with the Lord. Okay. When Jesus walked on the earth, he was the external Christ. So he used his influence to change the lives of the apostles and the disciples. He ministered the word to them. They saw naturally the signs and wonders. They saw miracles. You and I wish we, had, we, we could have been there to see. I mean, imagine seeing Lazarus being raised from the dead or imagine seeing Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and here's Elijah and here's Moses talking to him and here's the cloud of glory. This is my son. And they were there. Okay? So they saw all that. They heard all that. It was not enough till the external Christ became the internal Christ until he came into them and now he brought into them his glory so they did not see the glory they now were filled with the glory you see that that's when the change began so prior to that when he was the external Christ they were very attached to him very attached to him. Day and night, they were with him. They left all to follow him. I mean, think about, here is the Lord, and he shows up to the Sea of Galilee, and he says, why don't you go fishing? Well, Lord, we've been fishing all night, caught nothing, but at your word, we'll do it again. They, they threw the nets, the, these nets, and what happened? Now fish, so many fish came into the boats that those boats began to sink. They've been fishing all night. That's their business is to fish and sell the fish, right? That's what fishermen do. And that's how they made their living. They made their living by fishing and selling the fish. Now they've been fishing all night. 
which means they were still working. When the Lord was on the earth, they still kept their jobs because they, they had to keep living, pay their bills. So now they're fishing all night, didn't catch a thing. Jesus comes and says, okay, why don't you do it now? Throw that net. Well, Lord, we've been, you know, we've been at it all night, nothing. He said, throw the net, at your word we'll do it. And then all that fish and boats came, other boats to help them. And all those boats began to sink. And now when they get to the shore, Jesus said, follow me. And they forsook all, including the fish. They left all. It says so in Luke. They left all and followed him. Now, these kind of people were so attached to Jesus to not care about what happens to all that fish. And they were fishermen. They could have made a lot of money had they said to the Lord, can we sell the fish first and then follow? No, they gave up all, left all, meaning business too, and family too, and followed. They were very attached. And being attached to the Lord is a very important uh, condition, I think, for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So think about, they were not even saved yet, but they were attached already. That's powerful. So Peter could say to the Lord, now, Lord, I'm going to die with you. And Jesus said, well, you're wrong. You're going to die. You, you're going to deny me three times, in fact. Oh, not me, not me, not me. He had the will to die, but not the power behind it. He wanted to, but he couldn't do it. When the test came, he failed, right? But look how attached he was to the Lord, that when he denied him, and Jesus looked at him, and their eyes met, he wept. Peter cried deeply with pain. I love that moment when the Lord looked at him like that. And Peter knew he did wrong and began to cry and walked away. That is a man who loved Jesus. And Jesus was so attached to them, and he wanted them to be attached to him, and they were, that after he rose from the dead, now this is the Lord, watch this. He did not say, you bad boy, you Peter, you denied me. Huh? Not a word. He said, do you love me? And, and Peter just melted. What a precious Lord not to rebuke him for denying him. Huh? But they were attached to him. And I think it's important to understand the external Christ is not enough. Being attached to him in the natural was not enough. So now when the Holy Spirit came, this Jesus, the external Jesus that they had been with, now lived in them. And that's what it means in the Lord. You are not only attached, you are literally in him and he is in you. Because our strength does not come from ourselves. It is his strength. Be strong in the Lord, meaning let that oneness with him impart his strength to you. You know, you know how it is when you spend time with God, you feel like a giant. How many have had that happen to you? That's what it is. You spend time with the Lord, and suddenly he becomes so real to you that all that is his becomes yours. But then he said this. He said, not only be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Wow. So the second our, our, our fellowship and oneness is broken, we lose our strength. The second our fellowship and oneness is broken, we lose our fruit and we become useless to the Lord. So being in fellowship means we are in him. And we are in him. Now we receive his strength. But now also something else. The power of his might. Well, the power of his might... Um, it, it, it means daily strength, 
be strong in the Lord, that's my fellowship, but also be strong in the power, that's daily. I have to literally surrender daily to him to receive that. I can be strong in the Lord all the time. If I'm walking in fellowship with him and our hearts are united all the time. But power comes daily. God does not give us wholesale strength. He gives us daily strength. God does not give us wholesale power. He gives us daily power. Because there's no leftover power in the kingdom. Are you, are you listening? I've learned that the, the hard way. God does not believe in leftover power. It's power for the day, bread for the day. Strength for the day. That's it. So it's important that that oneness is daily oneness. Not so I miss it. If you miss a day, that's when the devil comes in. That's when we lose. Okay? So, living daily <clears throat> means that I am able now to appropriate his fullness. I'm going, I'm going to go a little slow here because I've got to really make sure you all get it. I've lived it. I know what I'm saying. It's hard to put it into words. I'll try, though. But when you are connected to the Lord, and there are days, sadly, we've all gone through that, where that connection is broken. And then the troubles begin with the devil. And then we get weak, and the devil becomes more real than he should. And the world becomes more oppressive and more powerful around us. And we feel like we're pulled back by this massive vacuum of worldliness. And we have no strength to stand away and keep ourselves free from it. Because we have, uh, that fellowship has been broken. And then the longer you wait uh, for reconnecting, the worse it gets. But then you wake up one day because you're, you're in such trouble. You're saying, you know what, i got to get back now quick. I don't care if it takes me days to reconnect. I'm going to lock myself in someplace. And you do that. When I got saved, I had an, ex I, I had an experience that was actually scary. So I got saved, gloriously saved. And some of the kids in church invited me to go to some apartment what I'm thinking they're going to have a prayer meeting and uh, it was not a prayer meeting they began to do things those are church people church people young people young people they began to do things that were unholy and filthy I walked out but walking out wasn't enough because it polluted my mind I was only 19 years old younger than most of you well some of you here. So think about a 19-year-old young man, my family not saved yet, my mom and my dad involved in witchcraft and palm reading and tea reading. We had witches in our house every single day. Fortune tellers came to our home every day, and I mean every day. You didn't know that, but I'm telling you. There were two ladies who, who came to our home every day to tell us our fortune. We could not live without them. I know this is not uh, normal in the West. It's very normal where I come from. Israel is full of witchcraft, even to this day. They can't live without it because someone has got to tell them what it says in, the, in their coffee cup. Do you people know what I'm talking about? How many do? Put your hands up. High. How many have no clue? Put your hands up. Okay. Oh, that little girl. I want to explain this to you, darling. <laughs> See, we, we drink what is called Turkish coffee. Well, I used to drink Turkish coffee. I don't like it no more because it keeps you up all night. And the coffee on the bottom of that little cup remains real thick. And so people in my part of the world, they turn the cup over. And then all the coffee, whatever you call it, powder goes into the side of the cup. And nobody goes to work till someone comes and reads it for them. It's that Yes, it's that weird. 
you know, it's, it's weird. And they take the little cup like that, and they tell them what's going to happen today for them. It's weird stuff, but it's demonic. We had that every day. Now think, and your palm. They would read our palms every day. Every day, those, those girls would come and look at our palm, tell us what's, what's going to happen today. Demonic every day. So I'm the only guy saved in the whole house. Think all of them doing that except me, thank God. Prior to my salvation, I was one of them that did that, they did that to me, all that crazy stuff. Think about how tough it was. I'm in the kingdom for two weeks. I was saved two weeks only. And those kids in church invite us to go to what we thought was a prayer meeting. It wasn't a prayer meeting. It was, well, you can figure it out. <laughs> and they began to do things that were really very filthy. And I walked out. But I was in shock. I was like, how can these people who call themselves Christians do that? Now, I did not want to go home. I was scared to go home because at, at home is, is witches and witchcraft and crazy stuff. Who wants to go to that? I was in church every night because I, don't, I did not want to be home to see this. You do the same, okay? I'm walking down Don Mills Avenue. It's still there in Toronto. I looked up and said, dear Jesus... I don't want this. I want you. It was night. Beautiful sky, stars everywhere, the moon clear, all that. I'll never forget that night. I felt like someone wrapped me with a blanket of love. When I said that, I said, Lord, I don't want this. I want you. Even though I could not understand how these kids who were singing songs of praise would be doing what they did that night. And I felt this blanket. But then I knew I had to do something about getting reconnected to the Lord because that pollution was still in my head from what I saw. And amazingly, when I got saved, which I never shared this with you, I don't even know if my family knows that. The day I got saved, I found a Bible in our home I did not know we had. I still have it to this day. I think I showed it to you. It's all torn up now. A Bible just showed up in our apartment on Don Mills and Shepherd, and I began reading that Bible. And when I got home after this madness of that night, but thank God I felt the Lord's love like a blanket, I got into the Word. It took me two weeks to reconnect. Because I was young. When you're young, it takes longer to reconnect. You know what I mean? But it takes me, you know, it took all those years now for me to learn. Don't disconnect. It's not worth it. And we all allow it. And today, we don't have to go to some apartment. It's right there on your, on your phone. It's on the internet. All this garbage is there. And maybe worse than what we had. So to be strong in the Lord means stay in fellowship. Stay in church. Don't go to a meeting that looks like church and it, and it isn't. All right? But you learn that as you grow in the Lord. And then it says, you connect daily with God's power to protect and keep you. And that's what Paul was saying. And then he said something powerful. <clears throat> he said, put on, let's just read this. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Wow. He calls it the armor of God. Means God gives it, we wear it. God does not put it on us. He only gives it to us. He only provides it. We put it on. It's his job to give it to us. Our job, put it on. He won't do that for you. Okay? Okay. Put on the whole armor of God. It's called the armor of God. God gives it, we put it on. Please, this is important. He provides it. It is your responsibility to wear it. And the people said? Amen. So, now, that you may be able, he said, put on the whole armor, that you may be able, so you have what it takes to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
that you may be able to stand against the plans of Satan. And there is no standing against the devil if we don't put the armor on. You can't even begin to stand against the devil. So there's no, and there's no falling or failing if you are armed. I want to repeat that. There is no standing against the devil if you're not armed with the armor. And there is no falling or failing if you are armed with the armor. It gives you amazing protection. And the people said, Amen. 4, verse 12, we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood means we wrestle against spirits, demons. Number two, against principalities. What are they? They are chief rulers of the highest rank. Against powers, that word means sergeants. They operate under the chief rulers. And then, number four, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. These are men and women used by demons and the devil himself to fight us. Because it says this world. And then finally, number five, spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, the devil is very smart. He copies God. Because God's army of the angelic is divided into five sections. You all know that, right? You don't know that? I'll tell you. Write it down. Seraphims, cherubims. Number one, seraphs. Number two, cherubs. Number three, living creatures, mentioned in Revelation, or they called bees, but the living creatures. Number four, archangels, and number five, angels. So on God's side, he has five divisions in his army of seraphs, cherubs, living creatures. I'm, I'm going slow so you can write it down, eh? And number four, archangels and five angels. So you want me to talk about that a second? Can you handle this? Okay, now I wasn't supposed to or even thinking about that. But seraphs, seraphs declare the glory. Isaiah 6, okay? Seraphs said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. They declared his glory and holiness. Then you have the cherubs. Protect the glory. They are the ones that protect the glory of God. It was the cherubs that protected the tree of life from Adam eating it. Okay? Remember that? Okay. Now, these, the, the cherubs are amazing angels with four heads each. Okay, imagine that now for a second. They have the head of a man and a lion. Then they have ox eagle. And they have four wings each. And they have little hands under every wing. That's quite an angel. That's why Paul said he could not talk about it. No? And their wings are, are connected to each other. And when they moved, it sounds like Niagara Falls. Okay? So they are very amazing. And they were the ones who protected your salvation. You say, would you like to know how? Yeah. Put your hands on I won't tell you. Okay. <laughs> I love these young people. I love the young people here. Okay. Because they're so hungry. Do you remember when Adam sinned? Okay. So God sends the sheriffs to protect the tree of life because had Adam eaten of the tree of life, in his sinful state, he would have lived forever, meaning no redemption for anyone. So we will all be born as sinful creatures forever and be destroyed. So God Almighty had planned our salvation. Adam, our father, sinned against God by refusing the tree of life. He could have eaten of the tree of life in his sinless state but he did not he said no God put those two trees in there 
to test his love. I don't know how much I should give you because I'm trying to stay with the armor, but I think you guys are like. <laughs> okay, it's really important to understand this. So God Almighty created Adam to share his love with him. He did not want to force him to love him. Okay? Love is not love till you share it. See? So God creates man because of wanting to share his love with that man. And he wanted that man to respond by sharing his love with him. So he chose two trees. He said, I'll see which one he'll choose. He said, you can eat all the fruit on every tree. Don't touch that one. You can eat also fruit of the tree of life in your sinless, holy state. But you all know the story. He chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what the devil offered Adam and Eve is one thing they could not have, divinity. He said, you'll be like God. The only way to be like God is through Jesus. Okay? That's something, something else we'll talk about some other time. So now in his sinful state, he could have eaten of the tree of life and lived forever as a sinner. And God said, no, you won't. So the sheriffs were sent to protect our salvation by not letting him eat in his sinful state. That's amazing, huh? So that's the second division of the angels. The third are called living creatures in the book of Revelation. And they are the angels of judgment. They're the ones who said, come and see. I'm not teaching on angels tonight. One day maybe I will. I'll give you more later, okay? But then you have archangels. Now, according to the Bible, there's only three of them. There's Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer, who was Lucifer. Today he is Satan the devil. And Lucifer was the mightiest of all angels because he walked up and down in the middle of the stones of fire, according to Ezekiel 28. And he had the control over the planet Earth. He ruled this planet at one time. He was perfect in all his ways till sin was found in him. And what was that sin? The first sin, jealousy. The first sin mentioned in the Bible is jealousy because the devil became jealous of God. Okay? So, when the devil was cast out to the earth, the earth was destroyed. Destroyed completely. For billions of years, the earth was destroyed. It was a chaotic, formless planet in a dark universe. Today, people have uh, debated how old the earth is. The, the, the earth is billions of years old, proven by science and the Bible, because the Bible clearly states in Genesis chapter 1 that God restored the earth after verse 2. Okay? Okay? Because when you read Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Isaiah, it says, God creates nothing in vain. Therefore, the earth became formless and void by the fall of Lucifer. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. When? When he invaded heaven in Isaiah 14. I wasn't planning on saying all this, but you people just made me do it. <laughs> so, five angels, divisions of angels, today in glory, seraphs, cherubs, living creatures, archangels. And the archangels are three, Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer. Some believe there's more, but the Bible doesn't say a, a whole lot about that, so we can't either. Number five, we have angels. Angels, the fifth division of angels, have no wings. Not all angels have wings. Did you know that, John? 
Good man. Because the Bible is clear that angels appeared and were not recognized as angels. So it says to us believers that we will, in, we will entertain strangers unaware, but that they're angels. Why? Because they look like young men from your town. And therefore, there's no wings, so you don't know that they're angels. Quite simple. Now, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And now put on the whole armor of God so he gives it, you wear it. But this is something important. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Number one, demon spirits. Number two, principalities. Number three, sergeants under those principalities. Number four, rulers of the darkness of this world are people that, that the enemy uses and, so, and such things and wickedness in high places. So, when you read this, uh, <clears throat> you, you have to understand that their attack is not upon the body. They want to attack our souls. They're not after your body, they're after attacking the soul of men. Wherefore, wherefore, verse 13, wherefore, and what that Wherefore means is in view of the fact. So now he says, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, part of his might. Put on the whole armor of God and so forth. And here is our enemies, five divisions of them. Wherefore, in view of the fact I just gave you, now he says something powerful. Wherefore, take unto you, pick it up. Take unto you the whole armor of God. In view of the fact, or wherefore, verse 13, now it's your part to take, to take, take unto you. And the Greek says, take up or pick up. Wherefore, pick up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, we're in it. This is an evil day. And having done all to stand, now, wow. Having done all to stand, stand, and here's the first thing you do, okay? Now, I'm gonna say something here that is important. Paul did not say advance. He said stand. He, he, he said nothing about march on. He said stand. Means protect the grounds God has given you already. Now you have to hear this. This has nothing to do with winning the lost. It has to do with keeping our faith. May I say it again? The armor of God has nothing to do with you going out and winning the lost. It has to do with you keeping the faith. Say it. Say the armor has nothing to do with winning the lost. It has to do with keeping the faith. That's it. Keep, hold your ground. Stand is all you have to do. But now he said, stand therefore. Verse 14. Are you listening? Yes. Are you learning? Yes. Keep listening. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Now watch this. <laughs> watch this. Sorry about that, but just to get your attention, okay? It's okay. I'm getting to know you. You're getting to know me. Okay, now Paul is, is thinking and seeing a Roman soldier. And the Roman soldier in those days, and not just Roman soldiers, but people in general, they wore, they wore robes. They, they didn't have 
pants like we have today and nice jackets like we have today. They just wore a garment that was basically loose. And in order not to trip and fall, they would put something around their waist to keep it all tight and right. Okay? That's what he means by loins. But, but, okay. So, in verse 14, he says, having your loins girt about with what? Truth. So, we have to understand, now we're, we're going to look at the seven pieces of the armor. There are seven in, in all. We're going to look at it quickly, okay? He's talking about a belt or a girdle that keeps your garment all right and tight so you don't trip and fall when you're walking or fighting. Think about those soldiers. If they didn't have a belt around that garment, they would have probably tripped somehow. So where do we put the belt? Is he talking about uh, um, putting it around your waist? What part of you is always out of control? Your mind. Your mind is that part of you that you have to keep right and tight. And the people said, Amen. the mind wanders. The mind is always being distracted by all kinds of things. The, that mind of yours, that brain of yours, let's just say, the mind, it's like that garment. You just can't, you got to grab it. Tighten that belt around it, and only the truth will tighten it. Back in those days, they had a big belt. Not, nothing as nice as what I got. But they had a big thing, most likely made of some leather. And they would make sure you don't fall, so you put that thing on. Because it was always loose. And the thing that's always loose today is this. How many have problems with this one? We all do, because that's just the way it is. And only the truth of God's Word can keep that thing tight and right. So he says, truth. Now, Peter, the apostle, do you have an extra mic somewhere? Yeah. Uh, Dion, would you mind, my dear brother, help me if you just help me preach. Let's go to 1 Peter 1.13, because in 1 Peter 1.13, Peter tells us that we are to put this girdle around our mind, around the mind. So he's telling us clearly that we don't have to put a belt around our waist. That's for the natural guy, 2,000 years ago, uh, uh, people. But today, you have to really make sure your mind is under control. And that is what 1 Peter 1.13 says. You read that for us, please. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober in hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's it. So he's telling me that the part I have to work on to tighten and keep under control is my mind. With what? Truth. What is truth? John 17, 17 makes it very clear what the truth is. Can we go to John 17, 17, please, Dion, and read that for me? It says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Aha. Uh -huh. So Jesus tells us what the truth is. He says, Your word is truth. So First Peter says, truth, put the truth around your mind like a belt. And Jesus says to us, our precious Lord says, the word is truth. So the first piece of the armor that will help me stand, not advance, stand, and no devil can knock you down if you do what this says to us. So number one, we're not advancing, we're standing. Protecting territory God has already given us in the spirit. Don't lose it. And you must put that belt around your mind first to even start standing. So, 
the truth of God's word. Because only the word of God can regulate the mind. Only the word of God can control the thoughts. Say with me, the Bible regulates my mind. The Bible controls my thoughts. Say it again. And that is so important. And a lot of Christians are ignoring and neglecting the reading of the word. And they say, well, I don't understand it. You will if you'll read it long enough. You can defeat the devil even if you know only a third of it or less than that. Are you listening? And as you get older in the Lord and stronger in the Lord, your, your belt gets just a lot bigger. But at least use the belt you have already. No matter how thin it is. That's good. A bunch of young people approached the Al Moody one day. They said, Mr. Moody, today you've made a lot of mistakes in your sermon. He said, young people, I have used all the knowledge I have. What are you doing with yours? <laughs> so whatever knowledge you have, use it. And the people said? Amen. So, always know. You begin with those small belts of truth, but then they get bigger. And the mind gets more under control as you get stronger in the Lord, but you start somewhere. But only the Bible can really regulate the mind and control the thoughts. Satan is a liar. We all know that. And we can only defeat him with one weapon. Truth. Because he is a Liar. And you control liars with truth. Comprende? And he has no power over those whose minds are full of truth. The devil cannot push you down or defeat you if your mind is full of truth. That's how you all start. And we can all begin so easy. Even you young people have been saved only for a day or two. You, you begin. You can begin right there. Okay? Because we're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Remember that. Now, that truth, once it is in your mind, it will get to your heart. So, Psalm 51 verse 6, Dion, quickly. God desires that that truth gets into your heart. So David says something powerful in Psalm 51, 6. Please, go ahead. Behold, thy desireth truth in thou the inward parts. Thou desireth truth in the inward parts, and Dion, go ahead. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Aha. Uh -huh. Lord, you desire truth not only to be in my mind, but it goes down to my heart. And when it goes into my heart, I'll become wise against the devil. Be wise as serpents. Wisdom comes when truth fills the heart, not the mind. But that is a process. Are you learning anything? Good. So, now, that's how we begin. And then he says in verse 14, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So, we know that first belt of truth around our mind. Okay, that's a good start. Now the second piece, he says, that beautiful breastplate of righteousness <clears throat> has got to protect your heart. The minute the mind and the heart become united with truth, that's when you can cover your heart with that breastplate. And I want to give you just a little tip, a little, a little thing that I have found, and that is meditation. Meditation is so important because when you read the Bible and you receive truth, meditate on that truth. Let that meditation be like that cow chewing the cud, you know. Get all the nourishment out of it so good. And don't rush it. Don't rush anything. 
when it comes to spiritual things, you don't rush. And then you just let it just sink deep in your spirit. And that can, can happen so quickly and so easily. Even somebody who's a month old in the, in the Lord can do that. It's easy. And, and, and you learn eventually, it's not mental meditation. It is spiritual meditation. Where literally you are enjoying what you're reading. And not only are you, are you enjoying it, it becomes a part of you and begins to affect even the way you live. That's what it means, okay? And so David said something powerful in Psalm 37, 31, uh, Dion, please, about, about the word, the word, I love it. Oh, man, when that word gets into your, your spirit, man, something really happens. Psalm 37, 31 tells us what? The law of his God is in his heart. None no. of his steps will slide. The minute... Tucker, my good friend Tucker, the minute the word of God gets in your heart, you cannot slip and fall. You just can't. Because it keeps you walking with God. Yeah, everybody has had a moment of slipping here and slipping there. It's happened to all of us. But when that word gets in your heart through meditation, it gets in your heart through what? Meditation. And meditation is not... Mental, it's spiritual, meaning I'm enjoying it, Lord. Okay, let me give you a, an example of meditation. So, I'm reading, I'm reading a part, well, I've, I think my favorite book is becoming the book of Jeremiah, but anyways. And I'm reading this part. If a man, I'm reading Jeremiah 31, if a man put away his wife and she goes from him, now this is God talking to Jeremiah, and becomes another man's, shall he return to her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, God says to Israel, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. When I read that, Jesse, it just hit me so hard because... I'm thinking, Lord, you told Moses not to allow this. And you are doing it yourself. I was stunned. In the law it is written, if a man leaves his wife, or if she leaves him, and marries another, and marries another she's not to go back to her first husband because that would pollute the land. God says to Israel, if a man puts away his wife and she goes from him and marries another man, wouldn't the land become polluted if she goes back to her first husband? But you played the whore with many lovers. I want you back. And I just, it hit me. And it, I began to think about that. And I thought, God is saying to Israel something he didn't allow them to do under the law. And I fell in love with him all over again. I looked up, I said, what kind of God are you? That loving? That forgiving? Willing to take your people back after they have worshipped a lot of gods? And, and for half an hour I was crying, thinking about, that's my God. Amen. If he did that with them, he'll come after me. Oh, it moved me deeply. I was like, he doesn't give up easy. And you start to think, the God we serve does not give up on us easily. If a sheep goes away, he comes looking for the sheep. What a loving Lord. And then you think about what David said in Psalm 119. He said, Lord, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Come, come find me, please. What he's saying to God in that psalm is, I'm too weak to find you. Please come find me. And it just, everything that you've read comes back with life. And, and, and now you're just thinking and feeling it and loving it. And it's rubbing in your spirit such a powerful way. Now you start praying and talking to God with something you hadn't planned on saying to him prior. How many understand? Put your hands up. That's meditation. 
It just hits you real hard. Every one of you, it would do you good. It's not easy to read, but Jean Guyon, Madame Guyon, wrote a book called Experiencing the Depth of Jesus Christ. And then she has a book on prayer that is marvelous. And she talks about how she allows the word to trigger prayer in her spirit. And she read parts of the word and parts of the Psalms. And then if she feels the Lord on one verse, she'll stop. And let that verse kind of get in there real good. That's powerful stuff. So I, that's what I'm talking about. You let the word trigger the call or trigger the seeking or trigger the asking. That word has power to trigger the life in you. And the people said, Amen. that's what meditation does. And that's what puts that word in you so strong. Can we put that Psalm 37 back on 31? So he said, David said, Lord, when, when your word, when, when your law is in my heart, I cannot slip. I'm not going to slide. I'm not going to weaken. And the breastplate of righteousness the Lord literally covers us with his righteousness over our heart, of course, by the work of the cross. But now the word of God enables us to walk that word, to live that word. And we become uh, sober. Would you read for me First Thessalonians 5, 8, please, Dion? Um, because Peter says, be sober. Now, this word is very important. I explained that, but go ahead and read it for us. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Okay, see that now? He says, when, the, when that breastplate comes on your heart, you become sober. You become uh, <sighs> committed. Uh, to live righteously, um, to live holy. Uh, you become committed to not allow the world to get into your heart again. You put on uh, the breastplate, and now you are able to maintain holiness in your affections, in your hearts. And... There is a scene, oh, the Lord help me with this one. David hears Peter and John at the gate, and uh, they see this man there begging for money. And uh, Peter just, just focuses on him. No smiles there, just, it says, look on us. Well, that word, look on us, got a lot of power in it. Look on us, shoo, like, a, like, a, like a sharp uh, laser. And, I, you know, I don't talk about my experiences in the Lord, but I want to tell you this, this one. I had a vision of Elijah one time in, in uh, Trinidad. No, so sorry, St. Martin. First time in my life. I had a service in a, in a church, big church. And after the service, I was in my hotel. And I see this man in my room, thin and tall. And uh, everything in me knew this is Elijah. Now, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't dreaming. I was sitting in bed, reading the word. And there he was, stood there. And he had a shawl over his head with the most beautiful embroidery around it. White, like glistening white. And a glistening white robe. And the shawl, just like the Jews wear, was down this way and down that way. Thin face tall face, kind of wide forehead, and he stared at me. I was teaching 
here on the double portion anointing. And I was just beginning to teach on that. Wow. And I'm in in Saint, Saint, uh, in Saint Martin, and I see him, and I didn't know why he came. He was serious, no smiles at all. So about the same time, the greatest move of God hit this building. And the face of Jesus appeared right there, right on that wall. Look right, right straight you know, ahead. His face was right there for eight weeks. There's actually pictures of it. And on a Sunday night, this place was so packed. People were all over the place. This platform was way farther. It was much smaller than this thing here. Kids, people all over the stairs. And, and one, of my, one of my youth pastors began screaming, look, look, look. And everybody began screaming. I could not see that face. I think Debbie, you were there that night. Debbie Gibbs, dear God, she's still alive. I love that. <laughs> I love you, darling. You look marvelous, too, by the way. <laughs> you have to forgive the way I am, guys. I'm sorry. So I see the Lord's face, and suddenly the glory of God hit so hard. The kids, we had children's church up there. The Lord's face appeared on, a, on, on the blackboard. And a crippled kid was healed. They came running down those stairs screaming with that kid healed. The glory of God hit this place for probably three, four years. It didn't lift. And you're talking about miracles. We had miracles in this place that would, would numb you just what God did. It began with that vision. And I remember that. And that was the first time I understood, look on us. There's nothing weak about boldness. It's like they were filled with boldness. Not even in a little thread of fear. Bold in the Lord. And when I read that portion here, that he's going to read one more time if you don't mind, it talks about be sober. Be vigilant. Read that again. Let us, uh, but let us who are of the day be sober. And then notice, uh, Dion, he says, let us be, who are of the day, children of the light, children of the day, children walking in the light of the Lord, not in the darkness of the world. Be what? Sober. And that word sober is committed having made a decision that is unshakable in your life, you will not allow the world to pollute the holiness of God in your life. And I think sometimes, you know, I'm very hesitant to share my experiences because people don't believe them, but it's your decision because I know what I saw and that's all there is to it. And Paul, the apostle, in Acts 24, 16, I think explains this a little bit better to us. He says, and, and this is Acts 24, 16, 17, he explains what boldness is. He explains what I'm trying to tell you. Yes. He says, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense, towards God and towards men. Wow. I, I, I exercise myself. I come to that place that I want to have a conscience that is empty of offense towards the Lord. Meaning a life that will not allow pollution in your life to offend the Lord or offend men. The third piece of the armor is a very powerful one. Are you still learning? Yes. Okay. Now, I'm not going to be here too, too long tonight, but this is, I think, the Lord wanted me to bring this message to you tonight because we need it. And then he says this in verse 15. <clears throat> he 
He says, after you put that breastplate and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. For years, I thought this man preached the gospel. I don't believe that no more. I believe what he means because when you talk about feet, the, your, your, your feet move you from place to place, right? And you have to kind of put the Bible together sometimes when you read what we just read, let your feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel. And, and you, you've got to connect what, what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So where it says, let your feet be shod with the preparation. We're thinking, let's win the lost. I don't believe that anymore. I believe it has to do with directing our activities, our will, our doing the word, walking according to the word, because you learn one thing about the gospel once you've lived as long as I have. The gospel is not only news to the sinner but it also rules our conduct yes. it, 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 it's the good news for sinners it controls my conduct it's obeying the gospel so it's the gospel go tell the good news it's more than that it's also he that will come after me let him deny himself Take up his cross and follow me. That's the gospel too. That's the doing of the gospel. So we read the gospel is the power of God. Yes, unto salvation to them that believe, of course. But it's the gospel requiring me and requiring you to deny self, to take up the cross, to follow the Lord, and that, I believe, is what the Bible means by the peace of the gospel. The gospel of peace. And Paul, here now, has been dealing with us in Ephesians 6, all about the inner man. So when you look at Ephesians 6, and you read the, this amazing portion in verse 15, You've got to remember that what, what he's saying is, let the word control your mind, let the word control your heart, and now let the word control your walk. It's really what he means by that. It, it, it can have no other meaning. And then, verse 16, he gives us the fourth piece of the armor. He says, now take the shield of faith, wherewith you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now this is important because the shield of faith is like a canopy over my mind, heart, and walk. Because I have got to come to the place where I am fully persuaded that the scriptures are reliable. Wait, wait, wait. So, okay. Fill your mind with the word. Good. Fill your heart with the word. Wonderful. Fill your walk with the word. Marvelous. But now don't ever question it. Faith. Because it's no good in your mind, heart, and walk if you question. Above all, make sure you cover the word that's in your mind and heart and walk with faith. Make sure you understand it is reliable. Because you can't fill your mind, heart, and walk if you question it. That's why it says above all. Above all meaning make sure you do this to protect your mind and heart and walk by believing the Bible is reliable. You cannot 
resist the devil. You cannot resist his darts and quench them unless you believe that the Bible is reliable. So it's not the mind, it's not the heart, it's not the walk that puts out the fiery darts of the enemy. It's faith in the word of God. And that faith is in your mind and in your heart and in your walk. So he says, okay, put that belt around your mind and make sure your brain and mind is under control now, not loose like it used to be. Let the truth of God's word kind of control that mind in there. Make sure that word in your heart or meditation is so strong, it covers you with boldness. And make sure you walk it, for the light of the word will guide your walk and feet. But make sure that you don't question the word. Faith, believe what you have read. So let your mind now be full of faith, your heart full of faith, your walk full of faith. So the shield. Now, there's something about a shield that I think is so important. I am looking for a piece of something here, but I can't find it, but I can explain it. A shield goes up and down like this. It keeps you. I can still do that. It keeps you from the arrows coming at you from all directions. Think about the devil throwing arrows from, and you, and you got to go up, down, and mostly it comes from up. Because when they shoot arrows, they shoot them. Not like this. Most arrows are. So they're aiming at you from above. Make sure that shield is. If they come here, this, this, whatever. You protect your whole life with the shield. That is why he says, above all, dear God, I love it. I can shout, but I'm going to behave myself. <laughs> Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you will be able to what? Quench. Put out the fire of those arrows of the wicked. Thank you, Jesus. Say, thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands, say, thank you, Jesus. So by appropriating the word, by believing it, acting on it, those arrows will never come near you. And now, let's keep going. And take the helmet of salvation, verse 17. Wow. The helmet of salvation. Now, the helmet of salvation. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. One more time. Dion, please. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting yeah. on the the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Okay, now, the hope of salvation, I used to think when I was young, I'm saved, I'm saved, I gotta make sure I'm saved, I'm gonna make sure I believe, I'm, it has nothing to do with the past. The hope of our salvation is the coming of the Lord. It's not saying I'm saved, I'm in. You can't be in. Hello. You gotta be already in to receive the word. You're going to be already in for the word to be in your mind and heart and walk and faith. You're already in. Not getting in, you're already in. The hope of salvation is our hope of salvation. On that day we see the Lord. That's the hope of salvation. We anticipate the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because the hope of salvation uh, puts it in the future. Because it says hope. Hope has nothing to do with the past. Hope has nothing to do with the past. So what he says, now make sure you have the helmet of salvation. It's the hope of salvation. And we just read it there. Read it again. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and in a helmet, the hope of salvation. Aha, wait, read that again. And for, for a helmet, what? The hope of salvation. So now, now, 
Paul says, making sure to put the helmet of salvation, but Peter says it's the hope of salvation in 1 Thessalonians 5. You got to put the whole Bible together to even get it. Did you hear that? So the hope of salvation is hope, future. Future means the coming of the Lord. So if faith ever weakens in your life, hope is gone. And you're in trouble then. So keep that faith strong. And in 1 John, I'm almost done, almost done. Um, John, come up with you on the instrument back there. 1 John 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, it says, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope purifies himself even as he's pure. So, what is the hope here? It talks about the coming of the Lord, guys. That's what I just said earlier. Beloved, 1 John 3, 2, now are we the sons of God and doth yet appear what we shall be, but when we, but when, but we know that when he will appear, when he will appear, the Lord, will be like him, we're going to see him as he is, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Whenever you read the word hope, it has to do with the coming of the Lord and the future. And Peter calls it the hope of salvation. I love what Romans 8, 23 it says, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within us, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because hope, you wait for it. Because for it says, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it, the coming of the Lord. And now as I close this <clears throat> beautiful teaching, I want to give you the last two pieces of the armor as we go to Ephesians 6.17. And he says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and then verse 18, praying with all prayer. But let me just cover the sixth piece of the armor. The sword of the Spirit, God provides it again. It's the only offensive part of the, of the armor. And that is used when we are tempted. The sword is in our mouth. So the word covers your mind like the belt protects it, keeps it tight and right. The word protects your heart and you are solid in the Lord and bold and determined to live the Christian life and not allow the world in. Now that blessed word controls your walk. And now the blessed word is your faith. You don't question it. And now you look for the coming of the Lord. But now something else. Now that word is a sword in your mouth. Why? Because temptations don't stop. And so when the enemy comes to tempt you, you cannot properly defeat him unless you speak it. Unless you speak it. It says he cast the demons out with his word not his thoughts. May I say it again to you? Yes. Satan cannot read your mind as a Christian. He can hear your words. Wow. You have to tell him, get out. You can hear this. 
Jesus commanded demons to come out with his word. And we use the word. So when the devil came to tempt him, Jesus said, it is written. That was the sword. So now the word is in our mouth. And seventh and finally, verse 18, praying always with all prayer. Now, Jessica, my darling, the word can be in our mind, our heart, our walk, our faith, our looking for the Lord's coming, even in our speech. But we fight on our knees. The fight is on our knees because, David, only prayer keeps the armor working right. So I can have the word here in my mind, in my heart. I can have the word in my walk and in my faith and in my look and in my mouth. But if I'm not on my knees, it's not going to work. Because that's where God empowers every one of them. On my knees. So that's why he says so beautifully, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching the unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, this is what ignites the Word of God. What ignites the Word of God is prayer. Lift your hands and thank Him. Come on. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we bless your name. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your promise. Hallelujah to the Lamb of Heaven. Glory. Glory. Glory to the Lamb. Let's love Him. Glory, glory, glory to the Lamb. For you are glory. And worthy to be praised, you're the Lamb upon the throne. Sing it, John. And unto you we lift our voice in praise, you're the Lamb. You stand and let's bless the Lord. Glory, glory, glory to the Lamb. Lord, glory. of the living God fall afresh on me Spirit of the living God fall afresh 
melt me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, spirit of the living God. For fresh Jesus 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 there is something about your name master Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. You are Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven, let the earth proclaim kings and kingdoms and kings and kingdoms, they'll all pass away, but there's something But there's something about And all the blood of Jesus All the blessed blood I want to talk to you for a few moments, so remain standing, please. It's not often that I talk about the lake of fire. It's not often I talk about hell. When I had the crusades, I would give a clear-cut explanation of the gospel, and thousands would come to the altar and and give their life to the Lord. But what people don't know is I'm never free from the vision God gave me one day when I was in my 20s. That I see it still to this day. It's like it only happened today, frankly. I want to share with you because I think you need to know there is a hell there is a place called Gehenna, like a fire. I don't have to have a vision. I don't have to have an experience to believe it. The Bible tells us very clearly. But you cannot change the fact when God has shown it to you. And I saw the lake of fire. I'll never deny it because I cannot deny it. When the Lord called me, I used to stutter so bad, I never believed God would use me. And when I was 20 years old, standing in my room one day after having been Im immensely blessed by Catherine Kuhlman's ministry and I met the Holy Spirit in a way that cannot be described. 
And one day I kind of began to wonder, why is God doing all this? Like it's not the normal thing you hear. Angels appearing in my bedroom nearly every night, just looking at me. Satan one night showed up to destroy me and I felt like a blanket of warmth and love cover me where he could not and I fell asleep. And the Lord's hand physically, I felt it on my forehead brushing it. And I looked up one day, I said, Lord, why are you doing this? Because I heard Catherine Kuhlman make a statement more than once. She said, God does not give the Holy Spirit so we can have a picnic. That's what she said. She said, the Holy Spirit is not given for picnics. He's given for service. And I'm thinking, for a year nearly, I was gloriously experiencing what cannot be even explained or described even to this day, I'm amazed. And I just said, Lord, why? And suddenly in front of my, my face, not, not farther from here to where you're standing, David, a man or a woman appeared in my room. I can still see him even now when I close my eyes. I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't dreaming. I was standing in my room, looked up and said, why? And there stood a human being in front of me. His or her feet did not touch the floor because they were inflamed with fire. I still can see them trying to be free from the fire and I could hear them gnashing their teeth just like the Bible says. And I began screaming, no, no, no. And our house was very small. You could have heard anything from my bedroom. My family was all there. And to this day, they tell me they didn't hear me scream. I was screaming, no, no, no. And I heard a voice come from all around me. Preach the gospel. That's all he said. That's all he said. And I will never forget to the day God takes me home, and I think I'll remember this for all eternity, that person in my room burning. I could not tell men or, or women because the, there were just flames everywhere. That's all you see is flames. So when that was, was over, I, you can imagine how startled and in shock and numb I was. I couldn't even think straight or talk. That same night, I have a dream. So when I said, why, the Lord not only showed me a vision, now I have a dream at night. This is a Saturday night, Amy. And I see an angel of the, of the Lord in my dream, and he said, come with me. And suddenly, as I began coming, I noticed a chain, golden chain, attached to a massive door that filled, covered, it looked like the sky was the door and the angel swung it open. And I looked and I saw people, people everywhere, as far as the eye could see. And then the angel said, come with me again. And now he took me by the hand. I'm standing on top of the crowd looking down. And I saw multitudes, 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 multitudes. And they were moving Jessica aimlessly, not knowing where they were going. They were just looking around and just moving in the same direction. And then to my horror, I see a valley wide and deep, shooting flames of fire of all colors imaginable. And to my horror, I saw human beings in it going in and out of that liquid lake of fire. And now the Lord spoke and said in that amazing dream I'll never forget as long as I live preach the gospel because what I saw not only people in it but the crowd that was coming towards it were falling in by their thousands and thousands and thousands those in the middle or the back did not know it was there but when the crowds came near they tried to fight to hold back but the force of the crowd moving pushed them in 
and a voice came as clear as you're hearing mine, but very thick voice, very thick voice. Preach the gospel. If you don't, everyone that falls in will be your responsibility. And I woke up out of my dream. It was such an amazing moment of my life. I later, because it took me a while before I could talk, I said, Lord, if this is from you, have Pastor Jim tomorrow telling me those words in church. Because my pastor at the time was a man named Jimmy McAllister. And I would go to his church, mostly on Sunday nights, and I go to Maxwell Sunday morning. So I said, Lord, have Pastor Jim tell me that. Well, the Lord did more than that. So I got to, to church that Sunday night. I went in the morning to uh, Maxwell White's, and now here I'm at night. And they had a guest speaker. And I thought, oh, I wish Pastor Jim was preaching. But he was there anyways. I thought, maybe he'll tell me later. And this man I had never seen or known. I still don't even know his name to this day. Or even remember anything he said in his message except this thing. He says, I cannot say a thing till I say words. I don't know why I'm saying them and who should hear them. And he points in my section and says, someone over here needs to hear those words. Because I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, let Pastor Jim tell me the exact words that you told me in the, in, in the dream. And now the Lord was, went beyond Pastor Jim, because if Pastor Jim told me, it would have been very convincing. But God said, I'm going to use a stranger to tell him that. And said the same words. If you don't preach, everyone that falls in will be your responsibility. Then I knew I had to preach the gospel. Saints, I talked to Dr. Samuel, who told me he had the same vision of hell. And many others along the path of life have told me the same thing, who are in ministry or were in ministry. These were great people of God. Every one of them seemed to have had a vision of hell. I'm here to tell you, I don't want one of you there. Because there is no way out. There is no second chance. That's why the Bible says, make your election sure. That's why Jesus said over and over to those who reject the gospel, they will go to a place where there will be gnashing of teeth, tears and fear and gnashing of teeth. He spoke of the man who did not use his talent. He was cast out with the wicked. There'll be gnashing of teeth and tears, he said. So I'm going to ask you, are you really sure? I have to ask myself that all the time. Are you really sure you're still walking with God? Are you really sure when you die, you will go to heaven? Are you really sure? You know, I've only seen two people die when I was there with them. Only two people in all my life. Evelyn Roberts and my mother. That's it. Evelyn Roberts was in, at Hogue Hospital in California. And as I walked in, she was passing at that moment. It was the first time I ever saw somebody die. And I saw the nurses rush in and put a pillow under her chin like that because her mouth opened. But the one I really saw was my mom. Jesse was there. My children were there. The whole family was there. And that precious woman was worshiping God as she was dying. Worshiping God. And I said, Lord, that's the way I want to go. And every day I strive for one thing in my life. Keep walking with God on that narrow way that is hard to walk into and stay in it. But it's possible only if you stay close to the Lord.
then there's no fear whatsoever of losing your salvation. But can we lose our salvation? Of course we can. Of course. It's in the Bible. And so the one question we have to repeatedly ask ourselves in this life is, am I ready today? If the Lord returned today, am I ready today? Am I living the life today? So every head bowed, please. And I'm going to ask you that same question. Are you ready? Are you sure? Are you sure that if you died tonight, it could happen? If you died tomorrow, will you be in the presence of the Lord? Will you really be in His presence and see His smile? Only you can make that decision. So there are people today here and in your homes who are not living for the Lord. This is the time to make that decision. No more sin, no more worldliness, no more pollution. No. I want to live for Jesus, holy and pure for the rest of my life. Yes, I've made mistakes. We all have. Yes, I've had bad moments. We all have. But looking forward, I have made the decision. No turning back. Now, there are people in this auditorium and in your homes who have not yet made that decision for sure. For sure. Maybe you've made it and backed off. Maybe you thought about making it and then you weakened. No. This time it must be for sure. No turning back. Assuring our hearts. Making our election sure. And assuring our hearts. All is well. If you're one of those dear people that needs to make that assurance secure. And truly be assured. I'm going to ask you to come down the aisle and come stand here or kneel here and please let me pray for you. Okay? Please let me pray for you. Just start walking down here now, even while I'm talking to you. Just get out of your seats and start walking down the aisle and come here please now. Do not wait. Do not negotiate with God. Do not delay. This is critical. This has to do with your soul your eternal destiny. Just start walking now, quickly. Come down right now and, and just stand or kneel and let's just talk to the Lord for the next few minutes. Just come on and just kneel right here or stand here and someone will come and pray with you and pray for you. Let's do it now, please. And dear John, just pray for me. It is well it is well with my soul. Because that's the thing we want to make sure. That it is well with my life. It is well with my soul. All is well when we come and say, Lord, I surrender. I give you my life. No turning back ever again. No turning back whatsoever. Would you all just lift your hands and pray in the Holy Ghost for just a few seconds. People are still coming. People are still coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, wonderful Redeemer. I give you praise, Lord. I give you praise, Lord. Now, can we all pray out loud with them? Never one pray after me, dearest Lord Jesus, how I need you, and I need you now. Oh, dear, wonderful Jesus, I have nowhere to go and no one to go to, so I come to you. And I call upon your holy name, for you have said, in your word come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden 
I will give you rest. Now, dear Lord, I need rest from all the burdens of life. I want freedom from sin, from the world and its corruptions. And I come to you now and I ask you, forgive me, cleanse me with your precious blood. For I believe you came to this earth and died on a cross for me. For me, Lord. You died for me, Lord. If I was the only sinner, you would have still come and died for me. And I believe that. And I also believe you shed your blood. You gave your all. You gave your life to rescue my life. Now, dear Jesus, I surrender to you the best I know how. For I know you're alive. You rose from the dead. And one of these days, soon you're coming back to earth. And when you come back, I want to be ready. I want to be accepted in your sight. I want to see the smile on your lovely face. And so take my life. Live your life in me. I cannot live the Christian life. Only you can. Come live that life in my life and through my life. And dear Jesus, I need the Holy Spirit. Oh, now, send the Holy Spirit upon my life and fill me with the Holy Spirit that I can live the Christian life for the rest of my life victoriously with power. And now I declare you are my Savior forever. You are my Lord forever. You are my King forever. I no longer belong to the world. I no longer belong to the devil. I no longer belong to myself. I belong to you. My Jesus, my Savior forever. Amen. Now, Lord, you heard that prayer. And I ask you to fill them with the Holy Spirit. I want every one of you to lift your hands and ask the Lord to fill you afresh, some of you, with the Holy Spirit. Some of you for the very first time with the Holy Spirit. And I want Judy, my dear Judy, come and take the microphone and sing Holy Spirit. Thou art welcome in this place. As he fills his people, as he fills his inheritance, lift your hands and receive the Holy Ghost. Come on, people. Jessica, come with me. Holy Spirit, thou art Lord, fill the microphone. Lord, fill the microphone. hands saints for in thy presence there's healing divine 
Just go ahead and pick him up. Come on, quick. Stretch your hands towards him. The Lord is going to use this young man. Now, Lord, I dedicate him for your cause. Your cause! Your cause. Who came with him? Who came with this young man? Just come up here, whoever you are that came with him. Glory, glory, glory to. Come, come here, quick, quick. family God is calling the whole family I don't know who they are but I see they are only strong on them stretch your hands and pray for them Jesus, dear Jesus, <sighs> and on to you we lift our voice. People, there's an anointing flowing here, so lift your hands and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit afresh. And glory, shh, glory. These two here, quick. Three of them. Glory to a hey, Tucker, come up, help me, come on. To the land. Come, 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 come close. Glory. Now these girls, I don't know whether they're related to this young man. <laughs> the 
I want you to dedicate your families to God right now. Lift your hands and just say, Lord, we give you our families. This is, this is a family that, uh, oh dear God. I feel like a cloud on her. There is, there is, if I, 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 I've, I, I'm not sure how to say it except an anointing for sanctification, I feel it on, the, on this platform. It's like God is setting them apart. Lift your hands and thank Him. He's setting them apart. And unto you, we lift our voice in praise. You're the Lamb upon glory. Lord, I pray you'll set apart these precious people in this room tonight. Not only those at the altar, not only those on the platform, but set everyone here apart. 
sanctify them for your use sanctify them for your kingdom keep them as the apple of the eye hide them under the shadow of your wings you said to Peter Lord Satan has desired to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you. And Lord, what is so amazing is even now you're praying for all of us. You are our high priest. You prayed for Peter. But what is so glorious and so amazing for all of us is your our high priest also and you have prayed for us also and you continue to pray for us even now you are our intercessor our high priest and because of that we cannot fail we cannot be sifted like wheat your prayer kept Peter and your prayer is keeping us and will keep us unto the end lift your hands and thank him he is your high priest he is your intercessor he said Peter the devil wants to sift you like wheat but I prayed for you and when you are converted strengthen your brethren and today we stand and we're here because of our great high priest and glory who has prayed and continues to pray for each one of us by name before the Father. We cannot fail. We cannot be defeated. It's impossible for us to fail. And we can only fail. We can only fail if we decide to fail. You cannot fail unless you decide to fail. But as long as we decide no, He'll keep us as the apple of the eye. It's not just our decision. It's His power that will keep us. But we must make that decision. Come out of her in the glorious name of Jesus. Don't touch her. Come out of her in Jesus' mighty name. David, Jesse, go cast the devil out of her. Everyone lift your voice and pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. When the anointing flows, demons manifest. It's just a part of it, people. That's all. Come out of her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So this is a day, this is a night where God Almighty is sanctifying people here. Lift your hands and thank Him. He's doing it for you right now. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Jessica, come back here, honey. I believe that girl is being freed right now. Okay, come up here a second, Jess. Now I'm going to just quickly say one word to you and then I'm going to give it back to my daughter. Aren't you glad we're in the presence of the Lord like that? Jesse, come here, baby. Jesus' school is approaching. And all of you in your homes and here, if you have been thinking about attending the school, do it quick. I'm going to tell you prophetically, prophetically, we are entering into a season of glory beyond description for Jesus' school. And I don't say that lightly because it's not something I was thinking about saying. But, but and as I'm standing under the anointing, I'm here to tell you, those young people, just like I prophesied years ago, will shake the city of Orlando. You're going to see healings on the streets. 
miracles on the sidewalks, salvations in the streets. People are getting saved and healed when the young people go out there and declare the name of Jesus with power. And God was going to do it. In fact, even children, young children are going to, are going to be used by God like that. The training in Jesus school is going to be intense, more than maybe you realize. And so if you haven't signed up yet, you better do it. I'm telling you. All right. I love you. Thanks for coming. Jesse, you pray with them, and I'll just see you in the back. Yeah. Jesus, we're so honored to be in your presence tonight, Lord. We love you. Seal it in Jesus' name. We thank you for your precious blood that covers, that protects, that restores. We love you, Jesus. There's nothing like being with you. We're so honored. We welcome you, Jesus, into our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you guys so much. We will see you next Sunday morning. Michael and Jess here. We are standing in the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. Local church, Jesus School, uh, House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that. We believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we want to invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is going to do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing, and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're going to show you right now. We want to take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image Home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus' image will be inscribed. 
This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first-year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. May millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space in the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? 
Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.